I V M. Hello and welcome to the Wire Talks. I'm Siddharth Bhatia. Our guest today is a distinguished politician from Canada, an immigrant whose story is a compelling and inspiring one. He left his small village in Punjab in 1964. He was barely 18 because he wanted to study further and then he landed in England. Four years later, he migrated to Canada, worked in odd jobs, including as a manual worker, while he simultaneously studied, getting first an undergraduate degree and then a legal one. And eventually, he joined politics. In the year 2000, Ujjal Dosanjh became the premier, which is like the chief minister in India of the large province of British Columbia. And in 2004, he became the health minister of the national federal government. Dosanjh has been a big critic of religious extremism in Canada after clashing with those who advocate Khalistan and has been violently beaten up for his views. All this is just a brief introduction to his remarkable journey. You can read about it in the new edition of his autobiography, Journey After Midnight, Canada and the Road Beyond. And he has also written a novel, The Past is Never Dead, which touches upon immigration and how the diaspora communities carry their prejudices with them and how you can never get rid of what you have been identified as. Ujjal Dosanjh, welcome to the Wire Talks. Thank you. Good to be here. You've been traveling to India very regularly. You've lost count of how many times you've come. After all these years of leaving from India, almost 60 years now, does India remain close to you? Is it uh, what what draws you here? You know, India will always remain close to me. I'm Indian, and uh, I'm Indian by heritage. You know, Punjabi by mother tongue, and I am a Canadian by citizenship. That's what kind of defines me, and I find no contradiction amongst them. And what draws me back is. The desire to see change, the desire to see progress, the desire to learn more about my own roots, the desire to make a difference if I can uh, to a place where which gave me the first 18 years of my life, nurtured me, gave me education, and then I kind of disappeared. And uh, so I I keep coming back. Uh, It's sort of, you know, it's a process of trying to cure myself of that sense of guilt. I I have, maybe other immigrants don't have, but I do, because I think that that people shouldn't run away from even the economic circumstances of countries. They should stay and fight, and I ran. And uh, and that's kind of defined my life throughout. Mujal, when you left your small village to go to Britain at the age of around 18, it was also because you wanted to study more, among other things. Many things have changed since then in India, of course, but as you say in your new afterward, in your autobiography, some things have become actually worse. You are very strong in that piece about rising intolerance in this country. Uh, What have you seen that has alarmed you? Well, you know, even though I sit thousands of miles away, the images are um, sent across the oceans instantly, instantaneously. And I've seen lynchings. I've seen cops being beaten up because they're trying to defend somebody who's being lynched. I've seen, you know, the murders of scholars and rationalists and journalists. And uh, and I've seen I was here when the Shaheen Bagh was in its last kind of stages. I was about to go and see it the next day, except my travel agent told me I had to fly the night before. And uh, so I had to run and, and, and I left. I, I follow those things very closely because, you know, I saw the scenes of how the police went into the, the university at the Islamia Jamia University and uh, brutalized these students. 
and pictures don't lie. And, uh, and, and I was horrified that in the country that Gandhi fought the freedom for, these things could happen and there wouldn't be an outpouring of anger and uh, people on the streets demanding change, demanding fairness. But that didn't happen. I know that, that you know, there are elements, progressive elements across the country, everywhere, in civil society that is still fighting for some of those things. But I don't see a groundswell of uh, fight against some of those things. And that kind of terrifies me for the future of the country. You know, India has been known for its uh, civil resistance. As you mentioned, Gandhi, many of the tall leaders of the independent movement. You've seen that uh, when he gave a cry. Do you think that public resistance on the ground has not happened because of apathy, because of fear, because of what? You know, one doesn't, as an activist, as a public activist, you have to recognize that that people have to make a living. People have children, people have families, sometimes sick relatives, you know, old mothers and fathers and grandfathers that they have to look after. And it is very difficult to make both ends meet sometimes. And so I understand why people don't go out on the streets. Just yesterday, somebody said to me, you know, people can't just suddenly get up and resist all of them because, you know, they have their needs. And I understand that. But but from my point of view, uh, you know, if people of the country lose that instinct to stand up when oppressed, the country will not make progress. Even during the independence movement, we know large swaths of the country didn't rise up, but large enough swaths of the country rose up so that we could get independence. And I think that some of that sort of thing has to happen in the country. Who will make it happen? I can't tell you. I mean, we are, we can't even agree on our heroes anymore in India. You know, I count myself as an Indian in that context. When you think about India, you know, uh, some people's heroes are Nehru and Gandhi and and Sarhaddi Gandhi and Patel and some people's heroes are Gautse and Sarvakar and, and, and others. And other people's heroes are Bhagat Singh and, and, and those. And, and I think that if, we, if you can't even agree on, on your heroes, uh, the country will have a lot of difficulty uh, making progress. Have you talked to Indians about this? Indians uh, not necessarily uh, from civil society, but just citizens, maybe academics, maybe friends, and what do they say? I, I have. I, I have. I've even talked to some Indian politicians. For instance, I see up, you know, with pictures of uh, Bhagat Singh in particular. So if you, you know, if you glorify Bhagat Singh, then why, what's wrong with um, Amrit Pal Singh carrying a gun and saying, I want Khalistan with a gun? How, how can you, how can you justify I mean, you can say Bhagat Singh learned afterwards. They will argue Amrit Pal Singh can learn afterwards too, too. I mean, no no insult, no offense to Bhagat Singh. Obviously, he gave his life for the country. But ultimately, we as a society had to figure out, you know, who our heroes could be. And, uh, and if our heroes are going to be those that at some point used violence, then we how can we argue with people who want to use violence to change the country one way or the other now? You know, of course, your afterward also touches upon the global scenario. And right in your neighborhood in Canada, in the U.S., we have seen the emergence of uh, Trump and his uh, violent followers. So is this a global phenomenon? I, I think, well, I think perhaps it is. But I think what's happening in India is somewhat different. It's, it's, on, a, it's on a very large scale. It's more along religious lines. And whereas what's happening in the States is sort of more, more about racial lines. And, uh, you know, you have the Rust Belt and the poor whites and those that think that their lifestyles are being threatened with all this, these new immigrants and the blacks that already exist in that country. And they have fears. And those fears were actually incited uh, right after Obama got elected by the tea, revival of the Tea Party. You know, Tea Party was the revolution in the States. 
you know, the fight between the, the British and the and the, the Americans. And now they have a, they had a new new Tea Party suddenly arose after Obama uh, became the president, and their slogan was "We want our country back." Like, where where had Obama taken the country? So that was that was a cry from that rust belt, from the whites who felt threatened, from the powers that be that felt threatened with this new president who was harmless in a sense, a, a wonderful human being uh, who uh, spent eight years as president without, you know, without one instance of the wrongdoing, generally speaking. Uh, but that's when it happened. And then Trump took advantage of that and uh, and stoked the anger, stoked the uh, the uh, real anger, real racism in the United States that that was always there. It was uh, latent, but it was always there. And, uh, you know, I mean, before that, you had uh, you had the running mate of the other uh, the, the Republican candidates. Uh, there's a woman from Alaska. I forget her name. Uh, she was a governor from Alaska who said she could see the see uh, the Russia from from her living room <laughs> and didn't know didn't know geography. She was a harbinger of the things to come, and that's how Tea Party. Then uh, she became a darling of the Tea Party movement. Um, and the same kind of thing is happening in places like uh, Hungary, uh, um, you know, in South America, uh, in India. The difference is, I mean, in in Hungary, for instance, it's racism, it's race that's the issue. In India, it seems to be religion that's the inciting element. And uh, but it's equally tragic, you know. Religion is not, not the only thing that was your past. Religion was your past, but wasn't the only thing that was your past. If you want to talk about your past, let's talk about all of the past, all of the heritage. Well, as you know, that a lot of our history has been changed. Yes. Uh, so uh, we don't know what our past is at this moment. It's all in a kind of hazy, transitory way. Coming to your book, which I found absolutely fascinating because you've been really candid in it, uh, your memoirs. I read that when you moved to Britain as a 18 year old and lived there for three, four years, what was beginning to alarm you was the increasing racism around you because that was the period of you know, Powell. You were even beaten up. Did you see that uh, being uh, brown skin uh, was something that was not going to get you very far in Britain because you were studying while working. Yeah, I was going to night school while working and I had done a couple of O-levels uh, during uh, those years. I, I, didn't, I don't know whether it was the skin color that took me away to Canada, but I became aware of my skin color and my skin in Britain. In India, I wasn't aware of my skin. I was Indian, there were others, everyone was like me. And occasionally a white guy showed up uh, from, uh, you know, Britain or some other place as a friend of somebody who saw they were white. But you belonged and you were like everybody else. But once I got to Britain, there weren't that many immigrants in Britain at that time, quite a few, but not as many as they are now. Um, you stood out somewhat and you realized that you were different. And then you realize that uh, the Taddy boys and then later on skinheads, I mean, they obviously were acting out of fear. They felt this, this stream of immigration and immigrants is going to overtake them and their society. And they were, you know, lashing out against that. And I understood it as a young kid, but uh, I felt helpless. I mean, I, I but I, my, my reaction to that was to read more, to learn English, to understand what was going on, to listen to BBC all the time. And uh, BBC without commercials, without music, just debates, just news. And um, that's where I picked up English. And actually, I, I didn't speak very much English when I went to, uh, to England. And, um, and I think that um, it's true when you leave your own place, you go elsewhere, you become more conscious of yourself, the differences between you and where you are. And uh, you can take one of two 
routes or several, but at least the one route you can take is try and integrate into the society, learn what they're about, give up some of the stuff that you carry with you. The other you can take is go into a gato and just kind of go into the 15th century dresses of Indians of diff different regions and say, you know, I want to be Indian. My reaction was the opposite. I wanted to integrate. I wanted to learn. I'm very proud of being Indian. I've never given that up. Uh, it was very hard for me to take out Canadian citizenship. I mean, one of the main reasons I took out Canadian citizenship uh, was because I had become a lawyer, but in those days, the Canadian Charter of Rights didn't exist. So you couldn't become a lawyer unless you were a Canadian citizen. Here I had studied law and I needed to make a living. I couldn't practice law without becoming a Canadian citizen. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think that it's, you know, I did all right afterwards because if you're going to live in some place, you got to drop anchor. You can't just float. And I'm glad I did that because it led me to different experiences in life. And I think I'm a different man. I can't say better, but a different man. And then four years later, you moved to Canada where you studied, worked as a lumberjack, and then also became a lawyer. Where was all this drive coming from? I know that you wanted to improve your life, but where was this drive? Because to work as a law, uh, to study law and to have worked uh, on the, as a lumberjack, um, where was all this coming from? You know, sometimes it's family. Like my father, you know, we were not rich. But my father and his brother had five acres to the name together. And my uncle had four children and my father had four children. So imagine five acres amongst eight kids, right? But my father was a teacher. And um, we weren't the poorest family in the village. And his only thing to me, I don't know what he said to my cousin who went to England. I don't know what he said to my brother. The only thing he said to me, he wouldn't let me come to Canada, come to England in the first place. He said, you know, you, you, you should study. You shouldn't go. But I insisted and he relented and I left. But his only message to me was, even when he came to Canada to join me, uh, he said, I want you to study. I don't need your money. I have enough for roti back home. I want you to study. Somehow he knew that out of the four kids he had, I could study. And I wanted to fulfill his dream. And I also knew from having been a, a lumber mill worker and a union activist and an activist on human rights and other things that you can't go far unless you really have the skill to argue about things. And if, if, if there's something that, that, that lawyering can give you is the skill to argue at least for your own points that you want to uh, impress upon others. And so I think that's what led me to be a lawyer. And uh, at one time, you know, interestingly, I had admission at Carleton in Ottawa to be uh, to do international relations a master's with uh, a teaching assistantship with a scholarship. But there were 32,000 PhD unemployed, unemployed PhDs on the rolls in Canada at that time. So I decided lawyering would be better. But, you know, it's uh, that's where it came from. It, it came from my own urge to be effective and and something that my father had said, you know, I don't need your money, which kind of freed me up. But you mentioned during this answer that you mentioned that you were a union activist. So. Of course, I know I read about your union activism, but basically that did you did you start moving instinctively towards the left around that time? Oh, I had gone far left. I, w I was hanging around with Maoists at one time. You see, uh, Naxalbadi had just happened. It, when I came to England in Canada in 68, Naxalbadi had just happened. And there was this... Uh, Communist Party of uh, Canada, ML, uh, headed by a chap. So one day, this friend of my father's from our area says, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll take you over and uh, meet, uh, want you to meet your mother's uh, classmate. My mother had done, you know, grade, grade seven and eight uh, back in the village. And, uh, and I said, okay, I, I want to see my, my mom died when I was in grade two. So I said, yeah, I want to see my mom's, mom's classmate. 
So when I went there, that mom's classmate was a, a woman from the next village, and her brother uh, was the head of the Maoist CPCML. Amazing. Um, All I know. And, so uh, far away. And that's how, I know. And, and, and they used to do, issue a, a, a monthly paper called Chingadi. And, uh, and uh, I kind of got hooked. You know, I was young. I wanted change in India. I got hooked. And then within a few months, I, I learned that they were all about violence. And I wasn't about violence. And I, I, I just uh, rebelled and left and, uh, and actually apologized to a couple of people that I had done some, I had done some violence to. And, uh, and that kind of changed me. And, uh, and I think that was a turning point for me, I realized. And then, you know, I had not even read Gandhi's autobiography completely. Uh, that I read in the first year of law school at Christmas during the whole, during the Christmas break. And when I read that, I realized that uh, that life, you know, life isn't all about achieving something. Sometimes it's about how you achieve what you want to achieve, because that has a lot more impact on life. No, so we shouldn't get into too many labels, but are you a socialist? Would you call yourself a socialist today? I, I, I would call, you know, I was a member of the NDP, which is a sort of a demo, so, social democrat party. And the liberals, I joined federally um, uh, to be an MP. I mean, they are sort of, you know, uh, center left. Um, they have implemented many of the policies advocated by the NDP. And so I consider myself kind of a secular, progressive, democrat, somewhat socialist. So you you were put off by their violence after uh, having been with them for a while, and yet, uh, well, I won't say and yet, but unfortunately, you were a victim of violence in the early 70s. The radical six were uh, elements were growing, and you ended up being badly beaten up on your skull, 80 odd stitches, yeah, it was, and also on your hand. Yeah, it was February of 1985. And um, it was um, three months before June of 85 when Air India went down. And uh, I had been warning all the politicians publicly uh, and public leaders that uh, there was violence within the community. I was afraid that it would lead to murders and a lot of violence and nobody listened. I actually, and then I was attacked and I, you know, luckily uh, the wounds weren't that deep. If they'd been half an inch deeper, they would have reached my, uh, my brain. I don't know where I would have been. And uh, I wrote letters after that to all of the attorneys general across the country and to the prime minister uh, saying that I was worried. I was nobody, you know, I'd only run publicly twice for being a member of the Legislative Assembly. I was a rebel rouser on the farm workers issues, janitorial workers issues, on equality issues, but I was kind of a nobody. I'd never been, <laughs> I had no positions. But So I sent these letters and nobody responded until after uh, the Air India went down uh, over the Irish Sea. And, and then they scrambled, even then they made mistakes and obviously, Prime Minister Mulroney uh, condoled the death of all of those passengers with uh, Rajiv Gandhi, uh, not not knowing that uh, over 300 of them were Indians uh, who were Canadian citizens or Canadian permanent residents. So, you know, Indian uh, Canadian government was somewhat nonchalant, ignorant, um, and thought that this was an Indian problem. And it took a very, very long time, it took over 20 years uh, for them to realize uh, that it was a Canadian problem, not an Indian problem. You know, uh, whether you're brown or white, if you do violence on Canadian soil, it's a Canadian problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are many cases, you many instances you cite of complete apathy as far as the Canadian uh, political establishment was concerned. Well, they, they, you know, they thought these brown guys are fighting brown guys, right? Some with turbans, some without turbans, some with yellow turbans, some with blue turbans. <laughs> that these guys are fighting with each other. Oh, let them fight. It doesn't bother us, right? It only, I think, came home 
not even with Air India right away. I think finally it came home with Air India. And it came home, I think, subsequently when the government of India actually took some very strong steps. And uh, at one time, the foreign affairs minister, Clark, um, banned some of the organizations as terrorist organizations. I think that's when they really began to uh, take it seriously. We'll be right back after this short break. Okay, this is a show where I get to talk to myself. Myself as in Cyrus. I said, I'm Cyrus. The other guy is also Cyrus. But I was the first Cyrus. Cyrus Saukar, greatest actor India's ever produced, singer, dancer. He's on our show. We talk about how he launched India's greatest actor who will one day win the Oscars, Santosh, who now is his driver. Only on Cyrus Says, available on all the podcasting platforms. Who are you really? All right, so on the Habit Coach podcast, we have Doug Dane and we're going to be talking about understanding our own identity and what our mistaken identities are. He's a fantastic coach. Check out the episode on the Habit Coach podcast. Welcome back to the Wired Talks. So you think multiculturalism uh, prevented them? It was an easy way out? I, I think they used, I think the politicians used multiculturalism as a bit of a shield for themselves uh, or a bit of an excuse saying, oh, we don't know. I mean, we shouldn't be interfering there in their affairs. Uh, they, they forgot that these were Canadian citizens or Canadian residents and they should be treated as ev- like everybody else. And when they make mistakes, it's the Canadian politicians business just as when anybody else makes mistakes. So so it gives an excuse to the Canadian politicians to kind of say, oh, you know, hands off. It also gives the uh, immigrant communities a bit of a refuge to do whatever they want. You can't interfere in our affairs. You know, we're, this is our culture. Well, you know, if your culture is to beat up somebody, that's not acceptable. Whether it's India or Canada, it shouldn't be acceptable. And uh, but those politicians weren't courageous enough to say that because they didn't want to lose any 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 votes, and so it gave both the isolationists amongst the immigrants and the politicians uh, who were opportunists the the opportunity to do their own thing. So multiculturalism is is a double-edged sword. It it, it gives the protect protectioners of multiculturalism. Uh, the right to say, don't interfere in affairs, and then also to go and say, oh, we should actually be wearing 15th century clothes. You know, that's our real culture. This is the kind of thing that's happening in India now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we can go on and on about multiculturalism, but what I found also interesting was you mentioned that much, much before Blue Star happened, you had noticed some, uh, in fact, you mentioned one or two people in the 70s and 80s who had begun to be more radicalized. You mentioned the case of one gentleman who was always impeccably dressed, clean shaven, a Sikh gentleman, and uh, suddenly started keeping a flowing beard and all that. So that means before Operation Blue Star. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. It, before Operation Blue Star, you, you had Jigjit Singh Chauhan. Yes. Who uh, yes. was essentially a lackey of Pakistan for a while. Went to uh, Canada in the 70s and, and stirred up problems and, and gathered some followers. And this chap I'm, I'm referring to uh, happened to be one of those influenced by Chauhan, who suddenly then turned from a clean-shaven, tie-wearing, well-dressed, suit-wearing man into into a, a, a long beard, wearing and turban-wearing gentleman. And this was long before '84, and long, you know, '82, '83. The newspaper, Punjabi newspapers uh, in uh, Vancouver, in Surrey, had started referring to Hindus as Mahashas, as the hateful terms they would use, and hateful terms they would use for those Sikhs who were somewhat secular. And so, you know, it had it was beginning to happen long before Pindrawale came on the scene on top of Akal Takhat. And, uh, and I don't know why it happened. I don't know how it happened, but it was happening. I was noticing it. 
it bothered me, but you know, there was nothing, nothing to kind of point to in terms of solid evidence that somebody else was making it happen. I didn't know at that time that Jagjit Singh Chauhan was a lackey of the United States of America. These things kind of become clear to you as you grow older and you read more. What is the situation now vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Khalistani extremists? Well, you know, I think that there are people in the diaspora um, who have, who are not really integrated into the larger society, most of them, and they need a cause and they need a purpose to live and they need uh, a reason or a way of, um, I guess, reducing or diminishing their sense of guilt having lived having left the country. And I think they, those are the kinds of people that latch onto the idea of Khalistan. It gives them a purpose. They feel alive. Uh, they can take those slogans and take those flags into the marches. I always say that real Khalistanis are, are few and far between. And I say that because right in the eight, mid 80s, right after 1984, when they were saying that, you know, most Sikhs support Khalistan, I said, no, you're lying. That's not true. I said, show me that by holding a function in the name of Khalistan outside of a temple. Show me in Vancouver that you can gather more than 500 people. So they made their first attempt on the first anniversary of the Golden Temple incidents in 85. And they attracted 200 people into a park where they had the Guru Granth Sahib and they couldn't attract more than 200 people. Then they made another attempt at a very large arena, a covered arena uh, under a large roof. Uh, and they uh, advertised the issue all over the country. They had about 500 people. So, you know, <laughs> at a temple on any given day, there's more than a thousand people. If some get someone gets up and makes a fiery speech you don't say the thousand people are Khalistanis. Um, there are very few diehard Khalistanis. I think there are others that are hangers on who need a kind of sense of purpose in life and they think this is an easy thing they can understand and and uh, and get a high on. But you know well that uh, these are uh, very uh, very noisy lot and have influential friends they make a lot of, uh, I mean, they constantly are uh, trying to get in the public eye. At least it makes news here. It may not make anywhere else. The government of India is really, really upset and angry at this moment and has brought it up with the comedians. Well, you know, I mean, government of India has a right to be upset. But sometimes I think if somebody is just yelling or screaming Khalistan without any violence, without doing any violence, we should just ignore them. But then at the same time, I mean, I see the, I look at the actions of the government of India, they're equally guilty. Uh, anytime somebody says something, uh, they raise a hue and cry. Just because somebody talks about Khalistan in some temple uh, in a place in Surrey, you know, India is such a huge country, it need not worry. If there were more people in Punjab asking for Khalistan, you should worry. If there are more people asking for uh, Khalistan in Canada, people like me are there to say, take it in Alberta or Saskatchewan. There's a lot of flat land like Punjab and make Khalistan there. Population of the Sikhs in, in Canada is 3%. In India, is still 2%. So I think that, I think that they, they would have more of a logical reason to ask for one in color in, in Canada than in, than in Punjab. And, you know, by and large, the Punjabis, the Punjabi Sikhs don't want Khalistan. It's, it's only the guys who go abroad and feel isolated, alienated, unvalued in the larger society that they turn to things like, like this. But you know that during the farmers agitation, uh, there was a lot of, innuendo and allegations by uh, political parties who said uh, these are all Khalistanis. I mean, that's an unfair accusation to make uh, to Indian Sikhs. I, I agree with you. I, I, I had actually, I don't do too many interviews on these things nowadays. And I did one actually with uh, a news outlet uh, where I said, you know, I think this is, this is crazy. This is actually more, this is crazier than crazy because, uh, you know, if, if there are organizations like uh, 
Khalsa aid or something. If there might be some Khalistani tendencies in them, but they are coming and all they're doing is giving aid to the farmers and help to the farmers and not propagating Khalistan. What's wrong with that? I mean, let, they feel close to the, let, let them do it. The moment you think that they're preaching Khalistan, do something about it. The other thing that we have to learn, I think, India sometimes is too, th too thin skinned as a country. India, India is such a huge place. You should worry less about what some idiot says 10,000 miles away. We worry too much and we should assess what danger that person actually poses to the country. And most of the time, none of, you know, many of those people don't pose any danger. Some of them do, and you should be careful about them. You know, in your novel, you write, and you've touched upon this subject, uh, this, uh, this, you've analyzed this once or twice in your uh, interview. But in your novel, you write that how Indians in this case speak, your case speaks in the novel case, the Sikhs in Britain, how they carry their caste prejudices with them when they move to another country. In fact, they get more caste conscious. Is this diaspora uh, uh, security complex or insecurity, or do they get more conservative uh, as uh, they move abroad? I, I don't know whether caste consciousness uh, more or less has anything to do with uh, going abroad. I, I think the caste consciousness is high here and it's as high in those countries. Perhaps it goes much deeper, becomes much deeper because of the isolation, a sense of isolation they feel. But the main thrust of my argument in the novel is that, uh, that caste never leaves you. It's there in all its heinous uh, aspects. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're living in, in liberal societies like Britain and Canada and, and others, and yet we carry the, this caste with us and, and actually thrust ourselves deeper into it sometimes, as you say. And for me, it was a case of having experienced this firsthand when I got to England in the first week of my life there, there was an old man that was beaten up uh, for some dispute uh, in a home where I happened to sit. I was there. I'd been there only for a week. I, I still had my turban on. I didn't even know how to speak English. And this old, handsome, tall Dalit man was, uh, was beaten by this Jat guy who I knew. And I knew both of them. And uh, I froze. I, others, you know, uh, intervened and stopped it. Because I froze, and that, that thought of having frozen at that moment stayed in my head. And I wanted to write about, I wanted to actually expunge that, that sense of guilt I had for not having been able to do anything. I wanted to write about, I want to pay tribute to that old man who was a wonderful human being. Uh, he was very close to my cousin who I, who I had joined in Britain. Uh, he was like a father figure to me later on. And, um, and I thought I owed it to him to shed some light on what caste does, even abroad. Okay, coming to a very critical part of your career, Ujjal, you are a, in a sense, a model immigrant story. Go from here without knowing much English or any English and with not any money in your hand and end up becoming the premier of uh, one of the largest or the largest province. So I don't know. No, it's it's largest probably in terms of the area. Yeah. And uh, then becoming a union minister, as they, we call it in India, federal minister of health, uh, where you propose a lot of progressive measures. Uh, tell us about how you entered politics. Well, you know, my father was an activist and my grandfather, my nana, had spent eight years in British jails. So in both homes, I spent the first four years of my education with my nana in his village. And so in both homes, politicians and activists would come and visit. In my nana's home, the old freedom fighters would come and my father's home, activists of his age would come. And, um, and 
you know, I learned uh, a lot from them and uh, I, they were my heroes, those two men. And, uh, and one was a communist at the end, uh, a member of the CPI, and the other one became a congressy, having been in a Kali area. But they were both uh, good men men devoted to the country, the idea of India that developed during the Indian Peace Movement. That had a lot of impact on me. And uh, and I left in 1964 and always kind of, you know, immigrants, they might tell you otherwise, but when they first go, at least they pine for back home. They, they want to come. They want to be back home. So I was no exception. And uh, so I read a lot about India. In fact, the, the three years I spent in Britain were the years that I've ever read the most in any three-year period because I wasn't doing anything anything other than manual labor. So I wanted to read a lot and I was going to night school. And um, so all of that kind of, you know, added to this uh, sense that that just making a living and perhaps raising a family isn't, that's not what life is all about. That's part of life, but life is much more than that. And it ought to be much more than that. And if it isn't much more than that, then you're a failure. Um, and and so I have tried to be an activist all my life on the farm workers issues, janitorial workers issues, equality issues, gender issues, uh, gay and lesbian issues. You know, I, I was the first premier and first attorney general in North America to walk in a gay pride parade ever. And that was uh, back in 2099. And so I, you know, I take pride in that because for a kid from a village in Punjab to be able to take that position several years later, I think that's human progress. And I, and I, and I think that, you know, I, 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 I have always thought about life as uh, as an opportunity to change the world, not just to live your years. And I, I'm now cherishing writing. I mean, I uh, this is the first of the three novels, uh, uh, Speaking Tiger, Ravi Singh has agreed to publish. And um, there's two more. And uh, I'm, and, and they are about, one is about Canada. This one was about Britain. And um, one of them is about India and the other one, one of them is about the independence movement to 77. The other one is from 77 to now. And uh, I don't know whether they'll ever get published. The names I've given them is the first one from 47 to, uh, not 47, the, the period I wrote about was from 1900s, early 1900s to 1977. Gandhi's bastards, Gandhi's children who weren't true to him and his principles. And this one that I'm writing now, it's almost finished. God says children, they're very true to him. Uh, so, and then a uh, yeah, federal minister, where again, you took very, very dependent positions. When that party lost, you were out of politics. Are you out of politics right now? Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I think that's how it should be. I think that that you play an activist role and then you may or more, may not get elected. Uh, elections isn't the only way to do politics. Like we're in politics all the time, whether or not we do politics. So, you know, I had been elected for over 17 and a half years. And that's a long time in one's life. And I'd been an activist all my life before that. And I thought, you know, I should... Uh, I should take some rest. And our home was our home was being renovated, and uh, and so I became a janitor at the site. I would clean up after the you know the uh, the tradesmen uh, women had gone, and I'd clean up for them to come back the next day. And it took us a year to to complete it. And uh, I enjoy living in it. And I and then I turned to writing, uh, writing my autobiography. That kind of unclogged my intellectual arteries, and and then I, I thought I should all these novels, I, these two novels, the first about the independence movement and the disappointment afterwards, and and the the novel about England, the cast, uh, they were in my head all these years. I wanted to write, so I thought you know maybe I should do that now. 
Canada has been good to you. Canada has been good to me. India has been good to me. I, I, you know, I love this place. I, I always tell people. I think I said this earlier. You know, I'm an, I'm an Indian by heritage. I'm very proud of that. I'm Canadian by citizenship. I'm equally proud of that. I'm Punjabi by mother tongue. I'm very proud of that. Beyond that, I really don't give, give a damn about religions. You know, I, some people ask me. I say, you know, I, I've been born and raised in a Sikh family. I don't denigrate that. I'm proud of Sikh history, but I'm not very religious. I'm almost a completely secular guy. And uh, finally, uh, you've been coming here a long time. What's your impression of Punjab right now, this time? I uh, well, I haven't been to Punjab yet. I'm still in Delhi, and um, but I read a lot about Punjab. I, you know, I'm worried about. Uh, I'm worried about the situation in Punjab, a, a, a society or a state that can give rise to the phenomena of someone such as Amr Pal Singh and who would openly argue for violence and actually engage in acts of violence and the, society, and the state wasn't able to deal with him earlier. It took a long time. That's a worrying feature for me. And, I, and I'm not, uh, I have no truck or trade with any political party in this country. I'm just an Indian uh, and a Punjabi uh, who loves the, loves the place and come here to pay tribute to my ancestors. Well, I hope you have a really good uh, trip to uh, your village, your uh, state, and uh, meeting all those uh, familiar people where you will be one of them. That uh, thank you very much for this wonderful discussion. Your autobiography is really something to really inspiring, very good too. And uh, you've been through some rough times, but you've made made it. And uh, so thank you for joining us, the Wire Talk. We'll be back once again next week with another guest. Till then. Goodbye. Thank you. You can check out this podcast and other interesting ones on the Wire website, the IVM podcast website, or wherever else that you get your podcasts. Goodbye from me, Siddharth Bhatia, and the Wire Talks podcast team. How to enter politics? Hello, I'm Meghnad and this is the question I'm asking this week on Explain Like I'm 10. Joining me to give some answers is Aparajita Bharti, founder of YLAC and fellow public policy nerd. Listen to the podcast on the All About Now feed only on the IVM Podcast Network. Hello, my name is Abbas. Catch me on Hazard Aged Well with my co-host Urjita Wani. Our guest is film critic Mayank Shekhar. He talks about his favourite film Jo Jita Wahi Sikandar starring Amir Khan and Aisha Julka. Has the film aged well? What's the deal with bicycle racing? And where exactly is this film set? Find out all this and more on the IBM Pop feed and YouTube channel.